All right, hey, Nick here again. We're back, and this is Chapter 6 of The Indian in the Cupboard by Lynn Reed Banks. Let's get her name in there. Chapter 6, called The Chief is Dead. Long live the chief. Let's dive right in. He got to school early by running all the way. This is Omri, by the way, the star of our uh, story. The first thing he did was to head to the school library shelves for a book on Indians. And to his joy, he soon found one under the section labeled Peoples of the World, a book called On the Trail of the Iroquois. He couldn't take it out because there was nobody there to write write him down for it. But he sat down then and there was a bench and he began to read it. Now, Omri was not what you'd call a great reader. He couldn't get into books somehow unless he knew them already. And how, as his teacher never tired of asking, was he ever going to get to know any more books until he read them for the first time? And this, On the Trail of the Iroquois, was not exactly a comic. Tiny print, hardly any pictures, and no fewer than 300 pages. Getting into this was obviously out of the question, so Omri just dipped. He managed to find one or two fairly interesting things straight away. So I think dipped, you know, he kind of just scanned and took a look at little bits and pieces. He managed to find one or two fairly interesting things straight away. The Iroquois Indians were sometimes called the Five Nations. One of the five were the Mohawks, a tribe Omri had heard of. They had indeed lived in longhouses, not teepees, and their main foods had been maize and squash, whatever they were, and beans. These vegetables had, for some strange reason, been called the Three Sisters. There were many mentions of the Algonquins as the Iroquois' enemies, and and Omri confirmed that the Iroquois had fought beside the English while the Algonquins fought for the French sometime in the 1700s, and that both sides had scalped like mad. So the French and Indian War, otherwise known as the Seven Years' War, was waged during the late 1700s, just before the American Revolution. I think that's what they're referring to. At this point, he really began to get interested. The book, in its terribly grown-up way, was trying to tell him something about why the Indians had done such a lot of scalping. Omri had always thought it was just an Indian custom, but the book seemed to say that it wasn't at all, at least not till the white man came. Whoa, did not know that. The white man seemed to have made the Iroquois and the Algonquin keen on scalping each other, not to mention white men. French or English, as the case might be, by offering them money and whiskey and guns. Omri, so I think if they don't explain it here, they would usually offer a bounty. So one side, the English or the French would say, if you give me the scalp, a piece of the head, which is a tough thing to imitate, it would definitely be like, I killed this person, right? Um, If you can give me the scalp of this person, I'll give you money for it. It was like proof that you had killed somebody for them, which is still sad. Um, they give him money, whiskey, and guns. Omri was deep in the book, frowning heavily several minutes after the bell had rung. Everyone had to, someone had to tap him on the shoulder and tell him to hurry in to assembly. The morning lasted forever. Three times his teacher had caused to tell Omri to wake up. At last, Patrick leaned over and whispered, you're even dreamier than usual today. What's up? I'm thinking about your Indian. Listen, hissed Patrick. I think you're putting me on about that Indian. It was nothing so marvelous. You can buy them for a few pieces in Yaps. Yaps was their local news agent and toy shop. I know, and all the equipment for them. I'm going shopping at lunch break. Are you coming? We're not allowed out of school at lunch unless we eat at home. You know that. I'm going anyway. I've got to. Go after school. No, I've got to go home after... No, I've got to go home after school. What? What? Aren't you staying to skateboard? Omri and Patrick, would you kindly stop chattering? They stopped. At long last, lunchtime came. I'm going. Are you coming? No, there'll only be trouble. I can't help that. You're a twit. Twit or not, Omri sneaked out, ran across the playground, through a hole in the fence. The front gate was kept locked to keep the infants from going in the road. And in five minutes, by running all the way, he had reached Yaps. The selection of plastic figures there was good. There was one whole box of mixed cowboys and Indians. Omri searched till he found a chief wearing a cloak and a full feather headdress with a bow in his hand and a quiver full of arrows slung across his back. 
Omri brought it with part of his lunch, bought it with part of his lunch money and rushed back to school before he could be missed. He showed the chief to Patrick. Why get another Indian? Only for the bows and arrows. Patrick was now looking at him as if he had gone completely screwy. In this afternoon, mercifully, they had two periods of handicrafts. Omri had completely forgotten to bring the teepee he'd made, but there were plenty of scraps of felt, sticks, needles, and thread lying about the handicrafts room, and he'd soon made another one, much better than the first. Sewing had always bored him rigid, but now he sat for half an hour, stitching away and even without even looking up. He was trying to achieve the patched look of a real teepee made of odd-shaped pieces of hide, and he also found a way of bracing the sticks so that they didn't fold up every time they were nudged. Very good, Omri, remarked his teacher several times. Uh, what patience all of a sudden? Omri, who usually liked praise as much as anyone, hardly heard her. He was concentrating so hard. After a long time, he became aware that Patrick was standing over him, breathing through his nose rather noisily to attract his attention. <sighs> Is that for my Indian? My Indian, yes. Why are you doing it in bits like that? To be like a real one. Real ones have designs on. So will this. He's going to paint them proper Iroquois ones. Who is? Little Bear. That's his name. Why not call him Running Nose, asked Patrick with a grin. Omri looked up at him blankly. Because his name's Little Bear, he said. Patrick stopped grinning. He frowned. I wish you'd stop this stupid business, he said peevishly going on as if it weren't a joke. Omri went on looking at him for a moment and then went back to his bracing. Each pair of sticks had to have another, short stick glued between them. It was quite tricky. Patrick stood a minute and then said, Can I come home with you today? No, I'm sorry. Why not? Mum's having guests, Omri mumbled. He didn't tell lies very well and Patrick knew at once it was a lie and was hurt. All right then. Be like that, he said, and stalked off furiously. The afternoon ended at last. Omri accomplished the walk home, which was normal, do with, with, which with normal dawdling took half an hour, in a little over ten minutes. He arrived sorely out of breath and greeted his surprised mother. Have you developed a jet engine, or have you been expelled? With a lot of gasping and a request to go straight to his room without waiting for tea. What have you been up to up there? There's an awful mess on the floor. It looks like bits of grass and bark. And where did you get that beautiful little Indian teepee? I think it's made of real leather. Omri looked at her, speechless. I, he began to, he began at last. Telling lies to Patrick was one thing. Lying to his mother was quite something else. And he never did it unless the emergency was dire. Uh, but mercifully, the phone rang just then. So he was spared. For the moment, he dashed upstairs. There was indeed a fair old mess, though no worse than he often left himself when he'd been working on something. Little Bear and the horse were nowhere to be seen, but Omri guessed where to look, behind the dressing-up crate. A wonderful sight met his eyes. A longhouse, not finished, but no less interesting and beautiful for that, stood on the seed box, whose smooth surface was now much trampled over. There were hoof as well as moccasin prints, Omri saw that a ramp made of, made of part of the bark had been laid against the side of the wooden box up which the horse had been led. To Omri's delight, odd as it may seem, a tiny pile of horse manure lay on the ramp as proof of the horse's passing. It's got to be pretty cool, you know, to know that your miniature beings are, are real, that, like, you know, the horse leaves manure like that. Um, I, I assume the... Uh, the human beings have to do that eventually, too. I don't know if that's talked about in the book, though. Uh, and there was, and there he was, tied by a thread to an upright twig, hammered presumably into the ground, munching a, pile, a small pile of grass that the Indian had carried, had carried up for him. Little Bear himself was still working so intently that he didn't even notice that he was not alone. Omri watched him in utter fascination. The longhouse was about half finished. The twigs, which had been taken from the birch tree on the lawn, had been stripped of their bark, leaving them shining white. Each one had been bent into an arch. Uh, the ends thrust into the earth and cross pieces slashed to the sides with thread. More and more twigs, which were stout poles to the Indian, um, had been added, and never a nail or screw needed to strengthen the structure. 
And now Little Bear had begun to fix flakes of bark, little tiny needles, onto the cross pieces. He was seated on the roof, his feet locked around the main roof pole, which ran the length of the house, hanging these bark tiles, each of which he would first carefully shape with his knife. The knight's battle axe lay on the ground beside an unused pile of twigs. It had clearly been used to chop and strip them and had been made to serve Little Bear's purpose very well. At last, Omri saw him straighten up, stretch his arms towards the ceiling, and open his mouth in a tremendously noisy yawn. Tired? he asked him. Little Bear got such a fright he almost fell off the longhouse roof, and the horse neighed and er and tugged at its rope. But then Little Bear looked up and saw Omri hanging over the crate far above him and grinned. Sorry, I hit the mic there. So look at that. There you have Omri coming behind the dressing crate, seeing Little Bear and his awesome little setup he's made. Making himself at home. He's got to do something with his time. Little Bear tired. Work many hour. Look, make long house. Work for many braves. I make alone. Also, not good tools. Oh, not got good tools. Axe Omri give heavy. Why no tomahawk? Omri was getting used to his Indian's ungrateful ways and was not offended. He showed him the teepee he'd made. I suppose you'd w- you won't want this now that you've got the long house, he said rather sadly. Want, want. He seemed to have decided teepees had their uses after all. He circled it. Good. Give paints. Make pictures. Omri unearthed his poster paints. When he came back with them, he found Little Bear sitting cross-legged on the earth, facing the figure of the chief that Omri had put next to the teepee. Little Bear was clearly puzzled. It's plastic, said Omri. I bought it in a shop. Plas? Tick? Little Bear stared at the figure with its big feather headdress. You make magic. Get bow and arrows from plastic? Yes. Also, make feathers real, he asked with a gleam in his eye. You like that headdress? Little Bear like. But that for chief. Little Bear not chief till father die. But you could try it on. Little Bear looked doubtful, but then he nodded. Make real, then see. Omri shut the Indian chief into the cupboard. Before he he turned the key, he leaned down to where Little Bear was examining the, to him, enormous pots of paint. Little Bear, are you lonely? Huh? Would you like a, a friend? Got friend, said Indian, jerking his head towards the horse. I meant another Indian. The little bear looked up swiftly, his hands still. There was a long silence. Wife, he said at last. No, it's a man, said Omri. The the chief. Not want, said little bear immediately, and he went back to his work with a a bent head. Omri was disappointed. He had thought it might be fun to have two Indians, but somehow he couldn't do anything little bear didn't want. He would have to treat this chief as he had treated the knight, grab the weapons, and turn him back into plastic again at once. Only this time, it wasn't quite so easy. When he opened the cupboard, the chief was still sitting on the shelf, looking at him in bewilderment, blinking as the light struck his eyes. Omri saw at once that he was a very old man, covered in wrinkles. He took the bow out of his hands quite easily, but the quiver full of arrows was hung around him on a leather thong. And as for actually lifting the feathered headdress off his clean off his gray old head, Omri found he just couldn't bring himself to do it. It seemed so rude. The old man gazed up at him, blankly at first, and then with dawning terror. But he didn't get up, and he didn't speak. Omri saw his lips moving, but he noticed he had hardly any teeth. Omri somehow felt he should offer the old chief some friendly word to reassure him. So he held up one hand, as white men sometimes did in films, when they were treating with Indian chiefs with politeness, and said, How? The the old Indian lifted a trembling hand and then suddenly slumped to his side. Little Bear! Little Bear, quick! Get onto my hand! Omri reached down to Little Bear, reached down, and Little Bear climbed onto his hand from the longhouse roof. What? The old Indian! I think he's fainted! He carried Little Bear to the cupboard and Little Bear stepped off onto the shelf. He stooped beside the crumpled figure. Taking a single feather out of the back of his own headband, he held it in front of the old man's mouth. Then he shook his head. Dead, he said. No breath. Heart stop. Old man. Gone to ancestors. Very happy. 
Without more ado, he began to strip the body, taking the headdress, the arrows, and the big, richly decorated cloak for good measure. Ongri was shocked. Little Bear, stop! Surely you shouldn't... Chief dead. I only other Indian here. No one else should be chief. No one else to be chief. Little Bear chief now, he said, whirling the cloak about his own bare shoulders and clasping the splendid circle of feathers onto his head with a flourish. He picked up the quiver. Omri, give bow, he commanded, and it was a command. Omri obeyed it without thinking. Now, you make magic. Deer for little bear hunt. Fire for cook. Good meat. He folded his arms. He folded his arms, scowling at Omri. Omri was quite taken aback by all this. While giving Little Bear every respect as a person, he was not about to be turned into his slave. He began to wonder if giving him those weapons, let alone letting him make himself into a chief, was such a good idea. Now look here, Little Bear, he began in a teacher's tone. Omri! It was his father's voice roaring at him from the foot of the stairs. Omri jumped, bumped, bumping the cupboard. Little Bear fell over backward, considerably spoiling his dignity. Yes? Come down here this instant. Omri had no time for courtesies. He snatched Little Bear up, set him down near his half-finished longhouse, and shut and locked the cupboard and ran downstairs. His father was waiting for him. Omri, have you been in the greenhouse lately? Er, and did you, while you were there, remove a seed tray planted with marrow seeds, may I ask? Well, I... Yes or no? Well, yes, but... And is it possible that in addition you have been hacking at the trunk of the birch and torn off strips of bark? But, Dad, it was only... Do you know trees can die if you strip too much of their bark off? It's like their skin. And for the seed tray, that is mine. You've no business taking things from the greenhouse, and you know it. Now I want it back. And you'd better not have disturbed the seeds, or heaven help you. Omri swallowed hard. He and his father stared at each other. I can't give it back, he said at last, but I'll buy you another tray and some more seeds. I've got enough money, please. Omri's father had a quick temper, especially about anything concerning the garden, but he was not unreasonable. And above all, he was not the sort to pry into his children's secrets. He realized at once that his seed tray, as a seed tray, was lost to him forever, and that it was no use hectoring Omri about it. All right, he said. You can go to the hardware shop and buy them, but I want them today. Omri's face fell. Today, it's nearly five o'clock now. Precisely. Be off. And that's the end of our chapter, folks. Stick with me. Uh, and if you like it, you know, if you like what you heard and you want me to keep going, give me a like, drop me a comment, and we'll do the next chapter, chapter seven, Uninvited Brothers. Sounds like Omri's secret might soon get out. Thank you for listening.